Sovereign Grace of Mead Valley, www.sovereigngracecc.org. Amen. What a great time to see little RJ baptized. Amen? Amen. That is awesome. That is awesome. You know, I was baptized as a child a couple times in the Catholic Church and in the Christian Church. And no, it wasn't Pastor Gabe and Rudy who baptized me. But you know what? Another thing that happened when I was younger, when one of the biggest prize fights, boxing matches, that I ever, ever remember, I'll always remember every detail of it, was the Mike Tyson-Evander Holyfield fight. You remember that? Yep. I remember where I was at, what I was eating, who was standing to my right, to my left, everything about it, okay? And that's pretty good because my memory is... It's terrible. <laughs> and not everyone's into combat sports, and that's okay, but whether it's a boxing match, a combat sport, a Super Bowl, an NBA game, whatever it is, those events, they're huge, and people remember the details. You guys can hearken back in your mind to those certain events. You remember the details, the smells, the people, the foods. But those who are involved in it, who are competing in it, who are on that team or whatnot, it's an even greater undertaking. Their mindset, their training, their preparation is critical for victory. And all of us, each one of us here must understand as well that we have to have the right mindset. We have to have the right training, the right preparation if we too are to be victorious in combat. Amen? Amen. In the right mindset during combat, the right mindset during spiritual warfare can make you or break you. We could make great gains. Listen, people of God, we could make great gains in sanctification, in holiness, or we can fall back and be stagnant And it depends on our mindset. And so in our text this morning, we're going to look at the temptation of Jesus, our Savior, and how His mindset, going into battle and going through the battle, going through combat, was one of submission to the Father, among other things. And you and I, because of this, because of Him, because of his preparation, because of his mindset, because of his victory, we gain from it. We are blessed because of it. And we can identify how to become victorious in spiritual combat. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your hearts with me in prayer? Father, we praise your name. You are so good to us. What a beautiful, glorious morning to come together in the name of your Son. We ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us this morning, convict us, write your word upon our hearts that we might not sin against you. We thank you and praise you for your grace, for it is sufficient for us. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's holy, inspired word? Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. The Spirit immediately drove him out of the wilderness, out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. The word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, remember, the theme of Mark is that Jesus is the suffering servant who came to seek and save the lost. Mark was writing for Peter to those in Rome. So Mark gets right into it. He doesn't waste any time. He begins his gospel with, in the beginning of the gospel, reminiscent of Genesis. He gets right into the baptism of Christ, where testimony is given from the Father, and then bam, Christ is driven into the wilderness to be tempted. It's full of action. Now Matthew and Luke, they give us way more detail, and we'll come back to that later. But let's set the stage for what's really going on here. This is spiritual combat. Can you say spiritual combat? combat. This is a spiritual battle right here. 
Now, you might think you've gone through some spiritual battle, and you have, and you will. But Jesus the Christ went through more spiritual battle than all of us together ever will. Amen? This is the battle of the seed of the woman against the seed of the serpent. This is the battle of the prince of the power of the air against the prince of peace. The great serpent called the devil against the great God Almighty. This is the real deal right here. The real deal. Written in the Word of God by the Holy Spirit through the pen of Matthew, Mark, and Luke for everybody to know about. What thousands of years of history and spiritual battle had been leading up to was this moment right here. Amen? Amen. And like a fighter being led out from the back room through the crowd to the ring, so the Lord Jesus was being led out. And who's leading him out? Who's directing him out? The Holy Spirit of God, third person of the Trinity, leading him out for this combat. God appointed him for this temptation. God ordained him for this temptation. God led him for this combat. God caused him to go out into this battle. So remember that, people of God. Remember that when you're in the thick of the battle. Remember that when you're in the heat of it all. When you're feeling the pressure on you. When you're battling depression. When you're at your wit's end because of your kids or your spouse or because of me. When other people have somehow gotten into your mind, under your skin, when you're being tempted to sin, God brought you there. The Spirit of God directed you there. But you're not alone. Because the Spirit of God is with you. Amen? Now let's begin by looking at the timing of the temptation. Can you say the timing of the temptation? This is very, very important for us to ponder, practically speaking. What just took place before this temptation? What did Mark discuss? What did he write about? The baptism of Jesus Christ. Jesus and those around had just heard the audible voice of the Father giving testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. Can you imagine that? The Holy Spirit fell upon him in visible form like a dove. All three persons of the triune God were there at the Jordan. This is a glorious, monumental, spiritual moment right here. This is huge. One of the greatest moments of all time, we could say. A moment of honor and amazement and glory. So Jesus, he went from this mountaintop experience, you can say, right? A time of honor and glory and amazement and joy. And he went from that to what? To conflict in the wilderness. To temptation to loneliness, you could say, to suffering. He went from honor and glory and joy and all this great feeling of love and communion with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, conflict comes His way. Has that ever happened to you? No, huh? Of course it has. Things are going so well. There was peace. Everything was just rolling. Happiness, all your ducks in a row. And then one thing and then another, and then another, and then what is going on in my life? I don't understand what's going on here. Yeah, it's happened to all of us, right? Amen? And we should expect it to happen to all of us. You should expect it to happen to you. You should not be surprised when you give yourselves to the Lord. You and I should not be surprised. Okay, listen now. When you give yourself to the Lord, don't be surprised that this happens. When you consecrate yourself to God, do not be surprised. When you say, I am going to live this way, 
I am going to give myself to the Lord. I'm going to follow after Christ. Do not be surprised when trials and temptations come your way immediately. We shouldn't, and we shouldn't just expect to be tempted. We should be expected to be tempted regularly, often, harshly, severely. Amen? Amen. Another thing to think about as we're looking at the timing about this is that Satan is trying, he's trying to assault Christ right before what? Right before his ministry. Right before Jesus Christ is about to enter into his office of prophet, priest, and king. Right before something huge is going to take place in the kingdom of God, okay? Right before something huge is going to take place in the life and ministry of Jesus, Satan attacks hard. Right? You see the pattern there? Think back in your walk with the Lord and how that's happened to you. Now, when you're getting hit, you don't see it all the time, but then hindsight's 20-20, and then we look back and we say, wow, the enemy attacked me here, and that was right before this was going to happen. Right before my first book was published, I can go on and on about all the attacks that came on me. Oh, my gosh. Family, all this stuff. And now I can look back and say, praise the Lord. Praise God. But during it, what's going on here? That's a normal pattern for God's people. So think about that next time you're going through some heavy spiritual combat. Maybe God is positioning you to accomplish something huge for His kingdom. Amen? Amen. So the cosmic battle is happening. It's been happening. Right here in the temptation, it's happening and it's right in the wilderness. Some say maybe in that same desert of Arabia where the Israelites wandered for 40 years, where Elijah fasted for 40 days and nights. I think it's also important to note again that it's the Spirit of God who drove him into the wilderness. Remember verse 12, God took the battle to Satan. God took the battle to Satan. The Holy Spirit took the initiative. The Holy Spirit led him. Jesus was driven to enemy-occupied territory to meet who? To meet the devil himself. This is the first major assault on the kingdom of darkness. The first major assault. And it's an active first strike by the kingdom of light. It's an active first strike by God Himself. Amen? God doesn't play with sin. And we're going to see that. Now we're going to look at the reason of the temptation. And there's a number of reasons, but we're going to look at a few. And the first reason is Satan's pride. Satan has always tried to set himself above God. In Isaiah 14, 14, he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Satan heard what happened at the Jordan River, at the baptism. He might have even been there, watching from afar. He might have even saw the Holy Spirit come down and heard the voice of the Father. He knew that Jesus Christ, the second Adam, was here to overthrow his kingdom. Satan had been trying to put a stop to this for thousands of years, trying to wipe out the seed of the woman ever since the first prophecy in Genesis 3.15. And the kingdom of Satan was now being threatened. And people, people were going to be set free, amen? Amen. Satan was no longer going to be able to deceive the nations. And so here he is ready to tempt the Son of God himself. He tempted the first Adam, and now he's going to try the second Adam. And so we should never, ever be surprised when we're tempted by the devil. If Satan and his demons are not afraid to engage in spiritual combat with Jesus Christ, then why would they be afraid to engage in combat with us, with you and I, right? And they're not afraid. They're not afraid at all. Every believer will be spiritually attacked. The most righteous, the most righteous to the brand new, right? Right? Everyone, Job was spiritually attacked. King David was spiritually attacked. Peter was. Everyone. As the Anglican bishop wrote, J.C. Ryle, he said, 
If he, if he, Satan, cannot rob us of heaven, he will at any rate make our journey there painful. If he cannot destroy our souls, he will at least bruise our heels. And how true that is, right? So we must resist the devil and he will flee from us, James tells us. So the reason for the temptation, number one, is Satan's pride. And number two, it was ordained by God. God ordained it. God orders temptations. Listen to how beautifully the Westminster divines put it. God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. And they put that together from a number of passages, including Ephesians 1.11, which says God works all things after the counsel of His will. In John 19, 11, where Jesus said, you could have no power against me at all against me except if it were given to you from above. Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from who? From the Lord, amen? You see, God has ordained every little thing that's happened Everything, even evil. Temptations and evil do not come about by chance. But God is not the originator of evil, or even of the temptations that could lead to evil. And we must understand that. And we must never blame God for the temptations we face or for our own sin. And we don't need to blame anyone else either for our sins. James 1.13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So, why does God ordain these things? Why does God ordain temptations? Why do they come to pass? Well, God can ordain temptations and evil, and He does so for the purposes of His good plan. Amen? Yeah. Genesis 50, 20, with Joseph and his brothers. You know the story. It's a great example, right? The cross of Christ is a greater example. What man meant for evil... God meant for, for good. And the cross, which is the worst evil in history, turns out to be the greatest blessing for you and I. Amen? So though it's ordained by God, it is ordained by God, Satan, he's involved and he has permission. Well, he has to ask permission. He has to ask permission for temptations. Job chapter 1, verse 12, The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. So even the smallest, smallest little things that could happen, Satan has to ask permission for. With Peter in Luke chapter 22, Jesus told him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. Satan had to ask permission to tempt Peter. Just like he has to ask permission to tempt you and I. And isn't that why the Lord in the Lord's Prayer gives us one of those petitions that we ask and pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation? Never forget, the devil is God's devil. Right? Someone wrote this and I already forgot who wrote it. He has no sovereignty or reign apart from what God gives him. The devil is God's devil. He has no sovereignty or reign apart from what God gives him. So every little thing that could annoy you, 
to every great thing that could try to crush you has been ordained by God. The right of temptation. Let's talk about that for a second. The right of temptation. Listen now. Eyes on me. God has every right to lead you and I into temptation. Every right. First, He's sovereign. He is sovereign. Every detail in history is in and under the control of the infinite, omnipotent, sovereign God of the Bible. Every detail from your yawning (laughs) to my forgetting, you name it, whatever detail it is, under His sovereign authority. He regulates everything in its exact order and directs them unto their proper end. Amen? He's in complete control. So he's sovereign. Secondly, we are no longer our own. You don't belong to yourself. We were bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6.20. This is why, check this out, we have no right to get angry or mad at God. We have no right. I know life is full of tragedies. And some things are absolutely horrifying and terrible and can seem unfair because of sin, because of man, because of Satan. But who are we to talk back to God? Remember Job? Remember Job? God said that to Job. Who are you, oh man? Brace yourself like a man. I will talk and you'll answer me. Listen to this quote from Scripture, and think about where it comes from. Woe to those who quarrel with their Maker, those who are nothing but potsherds among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? That's Isaiah 45, 9. Who quoted that? Paul in Romans 9, right? We're just clay. Who are we to get angry at the God of all creation over temptations and evil and things and tragedies that go on in our life? He sees the end from the beginning. He works all things out for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. How do we know that this little tragedy or great tragedy in our life isn't going to bear such fruit for salvation for many? We are not our own. 1 Corinthians 1.22 says, God has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. This seal speaks of a stamping of divine ownership upon believers. Divine ownership over you, dear Christian. And so since you and Christians, we are our new creation in Christ, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit to identify ourselves as belonging to God. Amen? And this guarantee is as a down payment for a future fellowship in heaven. How beautiful is that? Amen? So the sealing of the believer is permanent and secure. It's not a temporary ownership. It's a permanent ownership. Ephesians 4.30, you were sealed for the day of redemption. Earlier in that letter, Paul said, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. And so God has a right to lead you and I into temptation. He has a right to do so. But again, when He does, He never tempts us nor can He be blamed for our sin. Remember, Jesus was led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit for spiritual combat. He submitted Himself to God the Father and God the Spirit to go out and to be tempted like He had never been before. He was led into conflict, into a spiritual fight, into extraordinary combat with Satan. He submitted Himself to the Father, was led by the Spirit 
for our good. For our good. And we too, we must be led by the Spirit of God. We must be pleased to submit to God in all things, including spiritual combat, including times of suffering. We too must be confident in Christ and dependent on the Holy Spirit during our spiritual battles, no matter how hard it is, no matter how you feel, no matter how confused you might be, no matter how strong your emotions are, because it is for our own good and for His glory. Amen? Amen. Moreover, it's ordained by God to grow us in holiness. Temptations and spiritual warfare, it's ordained by God to grow us in holiness. These, these times of temptation and struggle and battle, these are the means by which He sanctifies us. The pressing of the wine press, okay? It's the pressuring upon us that bring about the sweet tasting wine. Amen? It's part of our training and ministry. And everyone is a minister. Everyone has gifts to use for the kingdom of God. Through temptations and suffering, we could recognize the sin in our own hearts where we're failing, where we drop the ball. And we can grow stronger against those sins. We can grow stronger against the temptations that cause us to fail, that open our eyes to where we're weak and where we fail. We learn to fight against it. We learn to hate it even more. We see where we failed. We see where we can overcome. We see how we must depend on Christ more and be led by the Spirit more. Amen? Amen. But temptation is real. There's a terror of temptation. It's real for every single one of us, and temptations are powerful. When you think about sinners and sin, think about the awful, controlling, manipulating parents of the 13 kids in Paris this past week. How terrible is that? Or the belligerent drunkard that wastes all his money and ruins his family? Or the ruthless slanderer who divides people? Or the person with uncontrollable anger who murders? Listen now, when we think about them, just know that the seeds of every sin are in each one of us. The seeds of every sin are in human nature. Even in the church, even among the saved. I mean, the burden from which I wrote my book on bullying was because of this very thing. In every church across America, in every church where there's people, where there's humans, every believer has the seeds of slander and gossip and favoritism and murder and the seeds of sin. It's in our hearts. And and many have, have... fed those seeds and watered those seeds even in the church. And and Lord willing, as we become more aware of the terror of temptation, particularly of relational sins, as we live by grace, showing Christ's love to everybody, welcoming everyone, being gracious to everyone, not turning and, and shunning people, then the world won't say the church is full of hypocrites. They didn't accept me. They turned away from me. They didn't include me. But they will say, wow, they loved me. They were gracious to me. They tried to include me. They are different. Isn't that John 17? Isn't that Jesus' prayer? And when we realize that each one of us are one sentence away, one action away from the terrifying effects of sin, And it's only by God's grace that we don't go there when we don't go there. You see, recognizing this fight right here, the terror of temptation, we can see that it can rescue us from being isolated. What do you mean? 
It can rescue us when we see how temptation is right there, how the devil is like a roaring lion. He's ready to pounce on you, right? And when we're girded up and ready and have the right mindset against it, it can rescue us from being isolated. Because it's easy for you and I to think that we're the only one who struggles with that temptation. No, I'm the only one. There's nobody there for me. I can't share this with so-and-so. They won't understand. Some of us have thought, I can't even go to God. I can't go to God with this sin. He'll never accept me. That church will never accept me. When we recognize the terror of temptation, it'll also keep us and rescue us from being arrogant, thinking that we can go a week without sinning or even a day. David was a man after God's own heart. He couldn't. Neither could Peter, who had enough faith to walk on water. They couldn't. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10.12, he said, Hey, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. See, temptations are real and they're scary. And if we don't acknowledge the weakness, the weakness of our humanity, we are more apt to fall than we think. And there are awful consequences of falling into temptation. And the scriptures are replete with warnings. Okay, filled with them. Awful, awful consequences. God wiped out, you remember God wiped out thousands of his own people in the wilderness. When Israel was tempted in the wilderness, when they failed, when the temptations hit them, and they responded by failing by not obeying God's word, by not trusting in God's word, by not having the right mindset. 23,000 were killed in one day for sexual immorality. How can we stand against a powerful enemy who wants to bring us down? Well, Paul gives us a sovereign promise from God. 1 Corinthians 10.13 God is faithful, amen? He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. Whether you feel like that's true or not, it's true. Whether you feel like you can't bear with it, I can't handle this. Well, I I think you should believe God's Word over your feelings. Our temptations will never be stronger than God is, amen? Never. He will be with us. He will give us strength through it. And this is why Christ faced Satan. This is why Christ was led by the Spirit, driven out by the Spirit to take the initiative, to take the first preemptive strike on the kingdom of darkness. You see, Jesus is the second Adam. He didn't come into a paradise of Eden like the first Adam. He came into a fallen, broken, sinful world. A world of wars and suffering and pain. An unforgiving world of death and disease. That's the world Jesus came into. And here he's driven into the wilderness to win redemption for his people. Amen? Amen. To restore what Adam lost. To break the curse. To set people free. Amen? And he did that. And he did it by facing real temptations. So let's look at them. What Matthew and Luke put in their gospel accounts, I have it up here. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if or since you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point on the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world with their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Amen? Amen. Without breaking these down too much because there's a lot of good stuff in here, let's focus in on the fact that these were real temptations. Real. From Satan himself. Okay? This wasn't just happening in in Jesus' mind, and these were just hypotheticals for a nice little uh, moral lesson for us. These are real temptations from Satan himself. Satan doesn't have to come to you and I personally at all. He doesn't. Matter of fact, none of us here have probably ever encountered Satan. Just some of his weak little demons. You know what I mean? But Satan himself attacked Jesus. For 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry, right? Okay, he's at his weakest point. And Satan attacked him with everything he could. He tried to get Jesus, our Lord, to abandon his goal to seek and save the lost. To abandon his goal to seek and save the lost. To abandon his role as the mediator between God and man. He tried to turn him away from his calling. Doesn't he try to do that with us? He tries to turn us away from our calling. Sometimes we let, sometimes, well, we do fail in temptations and, and then we think, oh, we can't do anything now. I'm just going to close the book and I'm done, right? <laughs> but that's not how we should respond. But he tried to subvert Jesus' plan. Jesus was just like Israel in the wilderness, being tempted. But unlike Israel, Jesus would not succumb to temptation. He would not sin because he would come to establish a new Israel, amen, to which he would be the head, the church. Now we can go on and on about these temptations, but let's look at the outcome of the temptation. With the three temptations recorded in Scripture, we see that the devil tried to get him to stop trusting in the Father's care. Okay, he does that to us. He said, turn those stones to bread. I know you're hungry. You haven't eaten 40 days. Come on now. You don't need to trust in God right now. You can just do it yourself. You hear that? You could just do this yourself. You don't need to trust in God's word. All three of these temptations, you can take them back to Genesis. You can see all the, the parallels to Adam, Christ, the world, the flesh, the devil. There's so much in here. But the devil tried to get Jesus to also grasp at worldly power. And he tried to get him to cast himself down from the temple to prove his deity. The three great weapons of the devil against an exhausted, tired, hungry Savior. Yet he did not sin. Amen? Amen. What did he do? He used the same weapon each time in response to temptations. The same weapon the sword of the Spirit. Amen? Ephesians 6, 1, the sword of the Spirit. He boldly used the Scripture as as His defense. This is why we have to know God's Word. We have to. If you don't listen to God's Word, if you don't read God's Word, if you don't know how to use God's Word, if you don't know how to respond to temptations with God's Word, you are susceptible. And you're going to fail. Adam was tempted in Eden to see if he was going to trust God and live by God's word or if he was going to reject God's word. If he was going to be disobedient to God's word and become his own God or attempt to. Jesus tempted in the same way, but unlike Adam, Jesus interpreted Satan's false rendering of a lot of scriptures, right? He interpreted scripture with scripture, not scripture with his emotions not Scripture with his circumstances. He didn't interpret the Bible with his feelings or his his own personal beliefs or his own reason. He interpreted Scripture with Scripture and used it against Satan. And he overcame the temptation of the devil where Adam did not. And therefore, the outcome 
praise God, is our redemption. Redemption was made possible. Amen? Amen. And would be accomplished by Him on the cross. But right here in this battle is where it went down. This was the beginning. And Romans 5, 12 through 21 shows all the comparisons between Adam and Christ. You could write that down. Adam was disobedient. Jesus was obedient. Adam lost it, right? Jesus had to win. He had to succeed where Adam failed. Adam as a man broke God's covenant. Jesus as the God-man kept God's covenant for us. Adam is a federal representation or federal representative of humanity, which leads to death. Christ, the federal representative of all who trust in Him and leads to life. Amen? Amen. We have law. We have grace. Jesus is fully God and fully man with those two natures existing simultaneously in one person. There were some things, okay, there are some things that Jesus experienced in his human nature alone, such as being hungry and thirsty and weak. The divine nature isn't hungry or thirsty or weak, and the divine nature doesn't need to sleep, doesn't need food, but his human nature did, obviously, and so we can see here that these temptations were truly real, even though he could not have sinned. They were real temptations. He felt the power of the tempter more real than any of us. He felt the power of the tempter. Because we failed many times, right? We failed many times to weak little demons. And most of the time to our own selfishness. Okay? Can't blame anyone else. It's not his fault or her fault. It was my fault. Okay? But you made me mad. No, it's still my fault, okay? All right? We can't blame everything on the devil, right? Like Bobby Boucher's mom. (laughs) The devil, it's the devil. No, it's it's your fault. It's my fault, okay? Maybe some little demons, but they don't even have to mess with us. But here Jesus felt the power of the tempter more real than any of us. He rode out these temptations by Satan himself. He rode those temptations out to the end and still did not give in for us, for His church. And as Hebrews 4.15 tells us, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet He did not sin. Amen? Amen. This is the beauty, the glory of the temptations and the cross. Christ overcame. And you, if you are born again, you are not your own. You are in Jesus Christ. You have union with Jesus Christ. And so His overcoming is your overcoming. Amen? He is our high priest. The high priest prays for His people and provides a sacrifice for His people. He did the first, he did the sacrifice at Calvary where he died for our sins. And now he currently makes intercession for all who trust in him. Amen? Amen. That is his present ministry. And we can go to him with anything, with any and everything that we go through. Amen? Amen? God is so good to us. Jesus Christ humiliated himself, becoming a man. Placed his, even though he continued to have his divine nature, he placed the use of those attributes on the side to go through this temptation, to go through crucifixion, to go through all of that for us. We have a powerful, amazing, gracious Savior. Amen? Let us depend on him more. And be led by the Spirit as Jesus submitted Himself to the Father and was led by the Spirit, even walking into the valley of the shadow of death. Because God will always be with His people. He will never leave us or forsake us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give You thanks and praise. You are so good to us. We will never fully understand the depths of what Your Son went through for us. But we... We trust in you, and we praise you 
We thank you, O God, our triune God, full of grace and truth, just and righteous and worthy of our praise. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.